Last Sunday afternoon, I preached on the eternal abode of the wicked, the eternality of hell. I had a picture depicting people tormented in hell, and that's all it was, was a depiction. But I was telling Brother Gary, I decided that I would preach on heaven this afternoon, so I went to look for some sort of depiction of heaven. Now, underscore that word depiction, whether it's hell or heaven, because nobody, even in thinking and meditating on all of the words and the pictures that they put into your mind of both places, can ever really do justice to it because our finite minds just can't grasp. To begin with, we can't grasp the eternity. But I just couldn't find what I thought, in my view, was a good depiction of heaven. One reason was because of the depictions I found were all colored up with false philosophies. I could find all kinds of, of ethereal-looking folks, and they had lambs and lions laying down with the lambs, and I knew if I looked long enough, so I'd find somebody saying, are there going to be any dogs in heaven? And this kind of thing. Because people are so wedded to the here and now, to the material, to the physical, to time and space. We, we don't even realize what a, a change. All we can say to be an extremely radical change from whether lost people, as we studied last week in torment, or those who love the Lord obeyed the gospel, who sought refuge in the church, his spiritual body, and covered by the blood of the Lamb, and come before him to hear the wonderful pronouncement, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter you into the joys of thy Lord. I don't even know what the joys of my Lord really are. I was thinking some about things that we do all the time on earth that have not one thing in the world to do with sin, necessarily that we won't be about nor concerned about in heaven. Uh, think about some little things. Anybody have a medicine cabinet in your home? You'll never have to go to a medicine cabinet when we need one. There'll be no medicine. There'll be no medical doctors. There'll be no hospitals. There'll be no surgeries. There'll be no patients to visit. There'll be no infirm. There'll be no aging. There won't be any funerals. There won't <laughs> well, you want to have to turn on a light switch. Uh, never face temptation. There will not be any struggle whatsoever with temptation. It won't be possible to be solicited to sin because the devil does that. He walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom we're taught to resist steadfastly in the faith. You won't have to do that anymore. It just won't be there. Um, some little things like locking your car or locking the doors or having uh, having policemen <laughs> or having to have, such as we're going to, the Lord willing, next week, a class on protecting ourselves. Um, some of us who are considered old people, you know, you're never going to see any of those in heaven. I don't know what a glorified body in the likeness of Christ will be like. Uh, it's like John says, but we know we will be like him. But there won't be any people old and aged and decrepit and whatever like that. Um, there'll be no tears shed in heaven. On and on. There'll be no heat like we know it, no humidity. There'll be no cold. There'll be no snow as we know it, and ice. There'll be no wars or rumors of wars. There'll be no taxes. There'll be no governments as we know it. It's just impossible for us under our situations, except by the eye of faith, and by that I mean as the Bible describes it, that we form these views in our minds. That's the reason I had a hard time trying to find some sort of picture that depicted heaven as best it is described in the scriptures. I know that when my Lord was about to leave this earth and he was talking with the apostles about his leaving them and how the Holy Spirit would take his place with them, that he said, let not your heart be troubled. Now that's a wonderful thing. 
Now, do you remember our study on heart? The inward man, the spirit, last Sunday morning. The will, the emotions, the intellect and reason. I put those into one. And the conscience. Here is a statement from Jesus Christ. Let not your heart be troubled. That let has the force of a commandment. Anytime you see that, that you have the responsibility, and the Lord's telling us this, you have the responsibility not to be troubled in heart. Whether it be your intellectual, rational part, component part of your being, or your conscience, or your emotions, or your will. Don't let your heart be troubled. Now here's why. He said, ye believe in God. They were Jews. Of course they believed in God. Then he said, believe also in me. Have faith in me. Trust in me. Remember, he says down here a little later, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me in verse 6. But then notice that he points them beyond this life. Think of what all of the apostles were going to have to endure to be faithful to the Lord. Paul said to the apostles that he says, I think we were appointed to undergo worse than ever. Be the offscouring of the earth as the ambassadors of the court of heaven through whom by the Spirit the will of Christ was given. We are set as examples of suffering among men. So let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he focuses. In my Father's house are many mansions. There's room for all of you. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now that tells me a lot about revelation of God to us. Because we all know it's in words for our own understanding. Paul said, when you read what I wrote, you'll know what I know. So he says plainly, in my Father's house or in many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. That means whatever He has told us in His Word is to help us not let our hearts be troubled. And that's, that's a good thought. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Tell me what that place is like. Well, I've told you things that it will not be there. Time and space and material things will have long gone. A fleshly body with all of its frailties are gone. All the things that are just normal to living a daily life here just will not be there anymore. Even the need of marriage and the home will not be there as it is here. I just don't understand it, do you? My mind's too little to grasp it. And yet that's the glory and majesty and power that is going to be for those who love the Lord and keep His commandments and die faithful. Notice what he said, conjunction and coupled with the fact that if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will return again <clears throat> and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That's what's meant by Paul when he says we're saved by hope, Romans 8, 24. And I always remember that hope is not like we use it sometimes in modern English, just a wish. It's what the Bible says a faithful child of God has a right to expect with an earnest desire to receive it. Have, have you ever had something coming up that you've yearned for, that you've looked for, that you've prepared for, and now it's time for it to happen and there's some anxiety about it, but it's good anxiety. What will it be like? I, I'm, it's come now. It's time to enjoy it. It's time to experience it, to be involved in it. Well, that's what I'm seeing here. That's the idea of looking beyond all that the earth has to offer in the way of temptations and problems for the faithful child of God. And what helps us keep on the road to the soul's true abode, as the old song says. Why it's looking out there beyond all this when none of this will exist anymore. <laughs> no medicine cabinets. <laughs> none of that. He says, and whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. And that's when Thomas spoke up and said in verse 5, Lord, we know not whither thou goest 
or how can we know the way. He just didn't get it regarding the king and his kingdom at this point. That's when Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. And then Philip speaks up and said, Sure is the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, have I, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, then show us the Father? Which means, if you ask the question, how would God live as a man? Jesus virtually says, here I am. So he has gone through this life, faced everything we've faced, tempted in every point like as we are, but he never sinned in thought, word, or action. Thus he could offer his body a sacrifice on the cross for our sins, shed his blood for the remission of our sins, and make the gospel plan of salvation that which as we adhere to it takes us into glory. How do you conceive of heaven? Well, Again, I can't form in your mind what you only can form. But what you need to try to form concerning heaven is the same when, it, when you need to try to form the picture that hell gives you or anything else the Bible is giving you. You need to form it according to the truth that you read, the objective truth that you read. There won't be any evil there. What a relief. Do you realize... We probably don't because we have to deal with it every second of every minute of every hour of every day all our lives. We deal with evil directly or indirectly in everything we do. One way or the other. To one extent or the other. It's always there. But there won't be any evil there. The wicked will not be in heaven. The one who originated that which was wicked, the devil, he won't be there. Listen to Matthew 13, 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever. Have you ever severed anything with a sharp knife or machete or an axe? It's just cut completely in two. It's not connected at all in any form or fashion to any degree. Sever the wicked from among the just. Just think for a moment. You're not connected directly or indirectly or any form or fashion or to any degree with anything that is against God. It's cut off forevermore. Long gone. There will be no death thus in heaven for sin brings about separation or death. There's no sin, no, no death, no dying. In Luke 20, 34 through 36 and Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. Then he says, But those who are counted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being children of of the resurrection. You understand that? I get the general strong drift of it. It's just not going to be like it is here. The concerns we deal with every split second of the day won't be the concerns we deal with there. The idea that people will do wrong, the idea that there are wicked people Wicked acts, it just won't be there. Now, the book of Revelation, a highly figurative book, deals with some of this. I think it's appropriate that it's there because it's the last book of the Bible. It's designed to comfort those who are faithful children of God or are being persecuted because of their faithfulness. In Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more tears or death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, 
Notice I like this next word, for the former. You see, we're, we're in the midst of it now. But then it will be the former things are passed away. Have you ever, have you ever been in a situation where you say, I'll be glad this over with. <laughs> I mentioned we said that one way or the other for many, many times. I'll be glad this over with. Maybe it's a test. Maybe it's a job we have to do. Uh, maybe it's just being sick. And I'll be glad when this is over with. Is there any reason for us to take note of what's going on back there? Okay. We haven't had our schooling yet, so I don't know what to <laughs> So, when you're up here, you see things, and you wonder. No death in heaven. No sorrow in heaven. Have you ever sorrowed? That's a silly question, isn't it? Of course we have. Our hearts have been broken. But I'm telling you that God says there's a place where that will happen. Now, let me ask you this. When you hear about that, surely that serves to encourage us in keeping on, keeping on. We have to deal with people, many of them our brethren, I'm so sorry to say, they just simply don't live like the Bible says, and they fight you when you try to get them to live like that. It shouldn't surprise us because most of the New Testament is written to Christians not long after the church was established in the first century. And all of the error that was there was fundamentally coming from inside the church and trouble in the church and the way they wouldn't live like the Bible said they ought to live. you got some terribly strong language about what you need to do and why you ought to do it. And when you have even an apostle uh, sinning and Paul having to withstand him to the face. There is always a fight on our hands. Won't be there. As the old saying goes, we lay down our battle scarred armor when we enter heaven. No sin in heaven, Revelation 21 and verse 27. The scripture reads on that, and there shall be no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. I get concerned, and I stay concerned. I think the Bible teaches I must be concerned. About what? About keeping my name in the Lamb's book of life. And so should we all, because those are the ones that are going to enter heaven. And whatever we can conceive based upon the teaching of the Bible heaven to be, however we depict it in our own mind from the word pictures of the Bible, the majesty and glory and peace and paradise that's there, uh, surely we must form it on the basis of the teaching of the scriptures and it can never be all that it actually is. You remember what was said when the Queen of Sheba saw the glory of Solomon and we sometimes sing a song the half was never told me. She heard about it. Words told it to her. She formed pictures in her minds based on those words. But when she actually experienced it, that's how she felt when she actually experienced it. Well, we can think and we ought to meditate day and night on the goodness and the glory, the absence of evil that's in heaven. But I'm sure when we all enter the gates of glory, we'll say the half has never yet been told. No curse in heaven, Revelation 22, 3 reads, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and the servant shall serve him. Now we serve him here on the basis of the New Testament teaching. But we strive to keep our minds in harmony with the truth, set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. We labor to think on that which is true and honest and good report. We have to rebuke ourselves at times for having thoughts come in our minds that we know are wrong. That's part of being faithful too, is to recognize it and do something about it. We have to keep a penitent attitude and an inward man, a heart, a spirit that's easily pricked by the truth. We engage in prayer, and I dare say we hardly ever pray that we don't ask God for forgiveness and for strength to persevere and to be Christians. We pray for others who despitefully use us. We pray for those who are sick. We're concerned about all those things. 
you won't be praying prayers like that. I don't know what will be and how it will be to walk in the very presence of God in Jesus Christ, all of those worthies who've gone before. I just know there will be some things that are very important here for us to reach heaven that we won't do there. No corrupting influences in heaven. No apostasy. I'll never have to preach against false doctrine. There won't be any false teachers. Won't be any at all. Everybody will be there, and everybody that's there will love the truth supremely. Heavenly treasures are treasures that do not fade, that are not corrupted, that are eternal. Matthew 6, 20, we're told now, right now, as we live faithful to the Lord, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. We talk about what little we have or much that we have of this earth's good, and when we're getting ready to leave this world, how to protect it somewhat. Talk a little bit about that at noon, about how to keep Uncle Sam out of your pocket. How to have something to, as Paul said, the parents are to lay up for their children. Uh, and in some cases, some children are not worthy of having anything laid up for them. But nevertheless, the general rule is that you're trying to control, even after you're away from here, what you've accumulated here, whether much or a little. You think you're going to be concerned about that in heaven? I want you to think about something that has always been on my mind, and I've used it in funeral sermons. As much as you sorrow and miss your loved ones, if they are saved, they don't want to come back here. There is nothing, nothing, and the meaning of nothing is not one thing that's going to cause them to want to come back here. And you could say like some people, well, don't they love me? Yeah, but they want you to come there. Not them come back here. They want you to live in such a way as to be there with them. If you read Hebrews 11 in that great marvelous chapter on faithful service to God, you go into the next chapter and he says, Seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin that doth so easily beset us, and let us run the race that's set before us. What is he saying? In view of all these who are Old Testament worthies and never heard the gospel and never were members of the church, if they were faithful to what God gave them, they're pictured as in the arena watching the games, and we're down there contesting and they're rooting for us that we'll get there. And that's the way we ought to be. No evil can be in heaven because it's incorruptible and it's undefiled. Peter said that to our brethren by way of encouragement when he was writing part of the New Testament. In 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or living hope. How did he do it? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now watch it. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. Now listen. Reserved. Where? In heaven. For who? For you. And he was writing that to Christians then and now. Well, people receive inheritances and they do good with it or they do evil with it or they waste it or whatever they do. But it doesn't make any difference how much good you do with it. It's all going to fade. It's all going to be gone. It's all going to disappear. It's of this present world. The only way you can send it on ahead is to use it as it has to do with serving God in the church. But nevertheless, it is incorruptible, it's undefiled, and it doesn't fade away, and it's reserved in heaven for us. The righteous will dwell eternally in joy. I don't know, how, how, do, you, how do you understand the joy of a person who enters heaven? Have some of you seen the picture that sometimes appears on Facebook 
of what a father did for his child who all his life was confined to a wheelchair. And he turned the tombstone into that wheelchair and the little boy is leaving it, going up to heaven. He's walking. That's one of the prettiest depictions of the change of things here to there that I've seen. It didn't depict heaven, but it depicted the resurrection. Well, just think about that for a minute. Just to be able to leave behind everything that's a vexation of spirit that is at war with what is good and holy and trying to, to, to be a hindrance to everything the Lord's people are to be busy about doing. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. What about that? Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things. And I guess the question ought to be raised here, are, are we really looking for them? We ought to be. Be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace, without spot and blameless. 2 Peter 3, 13 and 14. The same idea is presented in Matthew 25, 34 and 36. Now that's earlier than the verses we read last week because we read about him speaking to those on his left hand Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. But here notice what he said to those on the right hand, those who are faithful on the day of judgment. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Like remember Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now what I like about this well, number one, a number of things. But what I like about it particularly is that I know that this whole scheme of things of the creation of the world and all that goes on and that our whole duty is to fear God and keep His commandments, to find God and be faithful to Him, that's all that matters in this life. That all of this fits into what was being prepared from the foundation of the world to where the saved can enjoy the glories and majesties and powers of heaven. All of it. The whole thing fits. And that's a wonderful thought to know that. In Psalm 16 and 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I don't know what all that means. How do you, how do you uh, get all of that out of just the words we have to use in our language? But you get all the joy that there is to have. When you're in God's presence, you have all the pleasures that are right pleasures it's possible to have in the very presence of God. And at his right hand always meant the place of power and might and majesty. And you have all of that waiting on you if you're faithful to him through your life. And we're plainly told, there's no use building a lot of time on this, that those who follow Jesus are righteous, John 10, 27 through 28. Because the process of following Jesus is to do His will. Notice my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. If you're loyal to Him, nothing can touch you as far as your eternal destiny and place is concerned. 2 Corinthians 5, 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So we see then that the righteous are God's servants, those who are faithful members of the church Jesus purchased with his blood. Let me read to you a few verses here as we come to the end of the book of Revelation. Here's what John had to say and what we have is the last chapter of that book, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, 
which bare twelve manner fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Christ and God are there, Psalm 11, 4. The psalmist also declared that heaven is to be God's sanctuary, Psalm 102, 19. The great messianic prophet tells us it's a high and holy place where God lives in eternity, Isaiah 57 and verse 15. And we acknowledge his dwelling place even in prayer when we look at the model prayer Jesus gave in Matthew 6, 9. And he said, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Both the Father and the Son are in heaven, Revelation 21, 22 through 25. We can be with them in heaven. But please notice it is a conditional promise. There are conditions we must believe and we must meet. We must serve and follow Jesus Christ faithfully all the days of our life. John 12 and verse 26. If any man serve me, Jesus said, let him follow me. And where I am, there's also my servant shall be, or there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. But the question is, what if you don't serve him? You think the father is going to honor you? And that shows you why the avenue to God is through Christ and there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. All of us must labor to be united in Christ by submitting to the authority of Christ, he who purchased the church and is the head of the church. And the glory which thou gavest me, Jesus prayed, I have given them, speaking of the apostles, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may also know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me and thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now we're taught we're going to be with him in glory, faithful members of the church, Colossians 3, 4. Paul encouraged the church at Colossae, and so all Christians, when he said, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We'll be with him in the resurrection, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we which are alive and remain, that's at his coming, shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet him in the clouds, to be with him forever. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now here's the thing. This sermon's designed to speak to us in the here and now before we ever get there so that we can get there, so that we can have our hope placed in heaven, that it would help us not succumb to the things Satan offers to get us wedded to this present world where the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life governs our thinking and our goals and our plans and our actions and our dealings one with another. We seek a heavenly country. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 11, 14 through 16 said, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, do you? That is, and heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. The sons of God will be like Christ, according to John in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that 
when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So I don't know how you form in your mind from the inspired word pictures that are given to us in the Bible what heaven looks like. I can't really do it. I haven't seen anybody else do it. All I know is that if words have meanings, they can help you rejoice and be exceedingly glad because the Lord is on your side as long as we love Him and keep His commandments. And it ought to cause us never to stop doing what's right. We ought to reinforce ourselves with a greater determination to study His Word, meditate on it day and night, to set our affections on things above, to be active in the church, to realize the power of the gospel is as powerful today as it was when it was first preached on Pentecost in Acts 2. That men who can be reached by the gospel, then the gospel can reach them. But whether they are or they're not, doesn't stop us from living like the Bible says, heaven will be our home. So as we close the lesson, take some time in your daily living to realize most everything you experience all day long every day is going to disappear. Whether it's just simply things that are finite and have nothing to do with sin, or whether it's evil things like the devil and the one who gets us or tries to get us to sin. This way of life, this manner of life, this life in the flesh and time and space and material things is going to be gone. And we should not let it take up our time. But we should meditate on the truth of God. That we can, by the word pictures of God, see heaven. It's not far away. Not far away at all. If you're subject to the call of Christ to become a Christian, we urge you to believe in Him, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Be faithful to Him. If you've sinned as a child of God, humble yourself, repent of those sins, and pray God for forgiveness, having confessed them. We invite you to do that now while we stand and sing.